Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today on this insightful conversation. Um, today's event is part of a project that is called Bridging Foundations for a Livable Future. This is a project that gave birth during lockdown as I was ta talking with uh, Sebastian Gagero and we were really seeing how the health crisis was unfolding um, related to economic crisis, financial crisis, and we were also seeing the important relation there is with climate change. Because we're actually seeing how on a global scale uh, there's a lot of transition and transformation happening and also people's response and solidarity is also very much visible all over in every corner of the world. So, so together with Seba we created this Bridging Foundations for a Livable Future to bring people together, to bring people together in open conversation, to cross-pollinate ideas from all around the world and to share insights that will lead to action. So thank you today uh, for joining us. We have Anne Moradian living in Paris. We have Mr. Mevar in Udaipur, India, and we have Gonzalo Munoz from Chile. Thank you. My pleasure. So, uh, Anne Moradian, you are a movement artist. You began your career in New York in the Anna Sokolov Players Project. And you also uh, worked with the Manuel Alum Dance Company in New York. You've been founding Perspectives in Motion in 1988. And here your focus shifted to education, to collaboration, and to interdisciplinary projects. Your 40 years of uh, work in dance, yoga, and martial arts has continued to be working also in terms of research and to be an advocate in terms of embodiment. So this is a systemic health possible through the embodiment. So, uh, Mr. Mevar, Sriji Arvind Singh of Mevar from Udaipur. You are the 76th custodian in the house of Mevar. You are also a business leader and respected in terms of your strategic thinking and your business acumen. And you work very much also for the Maharana Mevar Charitable Foundation in Udaipur. Right. Indeed. Gonzalo Munoz nominated by the Chilean presidency and the United Nations as the high level climate champion for the COP25 last year. Through this, you mobilize climate action in non-state actors around the world. You are also a co-founder of Triciclos, active in Chile and in Latin America, across Latin America. And you aim to offer a transformative service that will help the environment while also being financially sustainable. So thank you all three of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Camille. Anne Moradian, I would like to invite you to open up the conversation and to share a bit of your work and also the relationship that you have been working on between the work that you do on embodiment and uh, sustainability as general. So what I've, what I've discovered uh, over time, over long and deep time, is that the body is a, a system, complex system, uh, complex systems within complex systems, and that we can actually, through the study of the body, we're actually also studying the larger and the smaller worlds too. So what that meant is I, I actually knew a little bit more than I thought I did um, about the larger world. <laughs> um, so, and what I wanted to do and what I hope to do here is just to introduce the body to the conversation because what I understand is that we have the knowledge or we have sufficient knowledge to meet the challenges in front of us. And I understand that we also have sufficient technology or the capacity to develop technologies um, to meet the challenges before us um, and even have the resources in spite of you know population being an issue we even have the resources still 
uh, globally for all of us to survive and thrive, or at least survive. Um, and it seems like the, the one challenge that we keep running smack into is behavior, changing patterns of behavior. Um, and it seems to me like this is someplace, something I know something about um, because the behavior, it's driven by our thinking, certainly in our thoughts and ideas, but it's also really powerfully and often unconsciously driven by our emotions and our feelings and our habits. And these are things that we can change. Um, these are things that we can affect. These are things that we can get to know and therefore not be driven by, but drive with perhaps, um, or at least account for, and then work maybe toward uh, what we wish rather than just being driven blindly um, toward where we'd rather maybe not go. Yes, thank you. We are collectively around the world always focusing on our intellect, on the facts that we know, and on rationality. And in many ways, when we want to you know, drive transformation and drive change, we also realize that experience and doing is important. The conversations I have with you, Anne, are reminding us that the embodiment that we, that we have is much more than only um, mechanical memory that may have when, when we're doing things. The intelligence of the body goes beyond um, actually, yeah. our movements. It's actually extraordinary. And when I think about the body, so it is an object perhaps, but even more than an object, um, it's a process and a convergence of many processes that I guess are known as life. Um, and I've written this down because the language that I'm best at is actually the language of the body and it doesn't have words. <laughs> so I'm trying to just contain my mind just a little bit so that I can speak you know, to people that speak in language of words. Um, and what, what, I, what I see when I'm looking at the body is it's a complex system that's made up of multiple complex systems like our cardiovascular system, our nervous system, et cetera. And it's embedded within not only a singular com complex system of our environment, but multiple complex systems of our cultural environments, our families, et cetera. So there's layers and layers and layers of complex interaction. And all of this affects who we are, what we think, how we behave, and how we interact. Um, it can be seen as a vehicle also through we use it to navigate and learn about and act within the world. And it's a space in which we become in this particular plane of material existence. It's our space of becoming. Also, even more beautifully, it's our dwelling place. It's our primary dwelling place. And I think that often, you know, we think of it as our first interface with nature, but it's not just our first interface with nature. It is nature. And that means that we are nature. And so the idea that there's a, a disconnect between humankind and nature, there is no disconnect between humankind and nature. And there is no disconnect between the mind and the body. There is none. It's just in our perception of it, our thinking of it, or our beliefs about it, where there's a disconnect. And that's a historic education that we're looking at. I hear historic education, and that, that reminds me of of uh, some another element that I think is very important in this conversation is about culture. Uh, we as an individual, in the way we are, we think, we breathe, and we feel, we're also part of something bigger. We're part of a community, we're part of a family, we're part of a city or a rural area. Um, so when we think of sustainability, and perhaps I can address these questions to, uh, to, to, to Mr. Mevar. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me <coughs> to your uh, uh, livable future, because uh, uh, the sustainability issue that we're all talking about and we'll be talking about is extremely important. Uh, I... Uh, have some views on this, 
and concerns on this. While I agree with Anne that there's no difference between the physical and the mind, I agree with that. And I agree with that concept as well in totality. But please bear in mind that I have been on several such uh, discussions where people start from a certain level, which is much higher, especially in our country, uh, compared to, say, Europe or, or Chile or, or, or whatever. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, I come from a rural, I live in a rural area in Rajasthan in India, which is where 70-75% of our population is living in India. Now, we have to, uh, if you're talking of sustainability, we have to see that we change the mindset of the 70-75% population of the whole of India. So, whatever program we put up, whatever collaboration we do with other countries, should probably start at the grassroots level, which is perhaps a bit elementary uh, compared to the discussions that uh, we are uh, having just now. And I know uh, that the wealth of knowledge that uh, our other co-speakers possess is immense, but it will not work very clearly, I beg to submit, it will not work unless you change the mindset of the common man in countries like India. Very briefly, today, uh, when the lockdown is being lifted and lifted being lifted in phases in India, people are of the opinion that everything will go back to normal tomorrow. Uh, what is normal is what they were used to before the COVID-19. Now, this is not going to happen. We all know that post-COVID-19, things will be very different. The, our lives will have to be very different. And therefore, the awareness of uh, the quality of life that is going to take place after COVID-19 and uh, uh, relating to that uh, change and relating to the change in definitions of the word normalcy has to be very clearly made. I mean, these people have to be made aware of. Otherwise, it's water over their heads. I am not uh, knocking our people here in India. In fact, I feel that uh, I'm very proud to be an Indian, and I feel that uh, their mind is second to none. But we must accept the fact that they do not have the exposure and they do not have the experience to uh, understand the level at which uh, we are talking about just now. Definitely, I connect, I think, very uh, properly, not only in a rational way, but also in an emotional way to both the perspective that Anne brought of the individual having the capacity of, by changing him or herself, then affecting uh, through their behaviors what, uh, what, what role we play in, in a local and then in a global scale. And, and then, uh, of course, as a uh, Mr. Mewar mentioned, we, uh, we have a problem of level of consciousness of the mass. Uh, and, and, and that is uh, unfortunately quite well uh, expressed uh, in many cases through the type of leadership that we have been uh, selected in, 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 many, in many ways around the world. And that's something that should be changing uh, through that specific rationality. Like if we, uh, contribute to allow people to get a better understanding of the whole, uh, of getting the, the, the sense of, um, of distinctions that we require to understand that, uh, as Anne mentioned, we are one species absolutely connected to the nature. We need a healthy environment in which we can be healthier. We, we, I mean, it's impossible to understand ourselves as uh, healthy individuals 
if we if we do not take care of the environment that uh, that that br brings us to life, and at the same time, that in order to understand that you you have to probably uh, reach a level of consciousness to understand that every single act that you do on a daily basis affects that that and and therefore you are building your own reality through your acts through your habits and uh, and and that is. Uh, dramatically being expressed worldwide by first the failure of our global systems uh, and meaning globally and locally on the way to uh, to, to um, the, on, on the way they have reacted to, to COVID-19. Uh, we have seen how lack of resilience we've had. Uh, it has been shown that uh, we have to improve much more our capacity of resistance. I understand COVID as a as an amazing opportunity, being a test of a crisis that is global, that is affecting everybody, that is connected to our habits, that requires science to be putting into the center, that is embedding all of our activities, and at the end, that will show how much we are capable of uh, by flattening the curve of the pandemic. We are we we will be. Uh, potentially capable of showing how we are capable as well of flattening many other curves, being uh, probably the climate crisis the first of those. It's about understanding the whole, bringing science into the center, and then allowing ourselves to be part of how we construct a potential global mechanism that is built upon the distinctions and, and the awareness of the individual knowing that everything that we do is connected to the others, is connected to nature, and that at the end, everything that we do will have a consequence that hopefully will be a positive one to ourselves and to the others. All of that is amazingly packed into the level of empathy. Because what has happened into COVID, that all of the positive reactions are when you are connected to those people that you don't know whom they are. Those people that are somewhere away. I mean, you, you stay at home, not necessarily because of yourself. In many cases, it's because of the others. It's because of those that are mostly vulnerable to the pandemic. Same thing happens with climate, and same thing happens with so many other environmental crises. So I see this as a great opportunity of learning, of increasing of level of awareness, and massively distributing uh, the distinctions that we require to solve the climate crisis. Yes, indeed. Yes, thank, thank you, thank you. Gonzalo. Um, with uh, what you're saying, indeed, on a global scale, we have seen this increased level of empathy at all levels, at all countries and at all levels of, of, uh, of, of richness. Um, another element that, uh, that I have been very clearly seeing, and I will compare, for example, the response on Germany with uh, the response in France, uh, when inviting to have social distancing, um, generally speaking, in some countries, there have been an imposement of rules of the particular distance to be had on the wearing masks and on putting on fines. What we saw in Germany is that there was an invitation for people to have the responsibility themselves and the civil responsibility towards the others. So in the end, the request for social distancing is the same but it's being addressed in a different way. One is, uh, as a rule, you, you must and you may not. And the other one is, we ask you to be um, conscious yourself and have your behavior uh, you know, adapted to that responsibility you take as a citizen. Uh, so there are, uh, have been quite, uh, quite some differences as well. And um, Anne, I was wondering what, what, uh, what you think of that, because in terms of intelligence and in terms of behavior and in terms of learning, uh, we learn uh, by being told things. Uh, we learn by being invited to think for ourselves. But uh, there's also probably also different, different ways of learning. What, what, have your, uh, what has your, your work uh, shown you in that respect? I think that, you know, in my experience, 
when we're when we're educating, when we're teaching, for example, it's really you know in relation specifically to who we're in connection with. So for example, the community Mr. Maywar speaks of is a very different framework, a very different uh, way of understanding, different knowledge base, different patterns and habits base. And so what would be appropriate or what would, what would elicit the response that's required at this point in time would be very different. Their values, for example, would have a huge play speaking to, you know, we speak to what we care about. What we care about is what drives us, you know, to move. So either we care about our own life and we're afraid, so then we hold ourselves in and we, you know, we do that. Or, you know, I've seen all of these responses, which is why I'm saying it, <laughs> um, you know, or we're concerned about someone who's vulnerable. And so, you know, it has no effect on us necessarily, and yet we go out of our way, you know, to take care of another. Um, what's the what's the value framework? What is it that we care about? That is the oh, sort of the 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 ingredient that brings things alive in a way to us that makes it meaningful enough to act. So I think that each culture, each community would have a different a different a different, I want to say trigger, but that's not quite the right word. Um, what would speak to each group is different. And we, we within our groups know best. We know ourselves well, usually. You know, what I is have, it? I have a question for Anne there, because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm wondering whether that, that ingredient is love. And, and potentially the connection with love through spirituality and even the potential failure that uh, religions have, have uh, I mean, played historically. Like, if you can trace that conceptualizing how much we, we can even still rely on religion to bring that spirituality that mobilize us from love, love from ourselves and our present and our future, love to our all, to the others and love to nature. Is there some sort of relationship in which your conceptualizing of body and the use of whether it's yoga on whether it's uh, um, any kind of exercise of uh, that 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 connects you deeply can be used? Because I think that we have somehow as as humankind. We have dismissed that, and, and sometimes it's time to bring that back uh, into the global culture. What, what do you think about that? And I would love to see how uh, Mr. Mewar also thinks about that. So my, my, my experience in a, in a living body um, comes from dance, uh, creative play, uh, choreography, collaborative creation, um, the martial arts, yoga, uh, energy studies. Um, and my path has always been uh, trying to find the balance between the warrior and the monk, or one could say between action and receptivity. We usually say masculine and feminine, but that somehow seems really polarizing to me. So, but, but how do we, you know, how do we find a, a healthy, constructive balance? And for me, the sense of the value of being in the body and consciously in the body is that it's an information system that allows us direct access to all the knowledge that we need on a, to, to, the, to the knowledge about who we are, what we care about, how we are, and what, and what we need in a given moment. So what's appropriate, what's optimal? on an individual level, but also it allows us to open to the information around us. So that can be other people. So that empathy that you're speaking of, um, uh, which is far more powerful and there's far more information in there than we realize. Um, and I understand why historically we have religions and cultures that shut down in, uh, the body. I understand because it's a powerful it's a it's powerful and it can be destructive if it's not 
really managed uh, with a sense of responsibility. It's a, it's a powerful it's a powerful tool. It's a powerful force. Um, so within our bodies, we have our sexuality, our animal drives, our spirituality, which really all of you know, and 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 our imagination, which is our creativity. But all of that also borders right on madness. You know, and there's a fine line that how do we walk that and be social responsible creatures, all of that at the same time. So when we open up to the inner to the, the information around us, this is important to be able to do to understand what's appropriate, what's the right response, what's needed, what's called for. Um, and we shut down from it all the time. Um, so my proposal is that Brexit and the US elections and what we saw here in France of really, and I think this is a sort of a, a trend toward national nationalistic closing down and shutting down is, is a response. There's been, there's been voices. We can see this now in, in the US with the racial uh, argument that's happening is there are voices that have been asking to be heard in the same way that pain in the body asks to be heard and cared for. There's voices that are there that have been ignored and shut off and shut down for far too long. And after a certain point in time, uh, it, it can't tolerate anymore. And from my perspective, this is precisely the same thing that we have with the earth, with our ecologies. You know, there's been feedback. We've, you know, if we were awake, many people saw it, responded to it and many of us shut it down. I'm comfortable, I don't wanna think about that, that's uncomfortable, it's confusing, what am I supposed to do? I'm a little tiny person. And yet each one of us matters. And I think, I think one of the things I wish we could all do for each other is affirm that we matter, each one of us, no matter how small, that each of us contributes to the culture of our own little space that keeps expanding outward. I think that's probably enough. <laughs> Who wants to uh, who wants to fall in or uh, continue on, on this thread, Mr. Mevar? Yeah, I just want to make a couple of points. Uh, I'd like you to understand, uh, fellow uh, colleagues on the on the conversation, that while I do not disagree with your points of view uh, at all, but you. you you take a certain level for granted, which is globally. Now, I would like to ask, in reality, how many people in India understand the word global? They have the lack of exposure. They have the lack of experience, not because their IQ is any uh, less than anybody else in the world, but they can't help it because they have not been exposed to this. And it's time, I agree with you, that uh, uh, post-COVID-19, there is uh, the geographical boundaries uh, will have to, in some way, uh, in our minds and soul, got to be abolished because Everyone in this world have very similar problems as far as the, uh, 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 the uh, infection is concerned. But if you expect that these people will absorb the global uh, parameters suggested, well, I'm afraid, uh, I'm not sure whether they are ready for accepting a global... First of all, they've got to be educated into the aspect of global globalization. You know, they don't even know anything beyond the village or beyond the state or beyond the country. Now, here we are asking them to transgress all these boundaries and take their mind to uh, a level at which they have never had the opportunity to... to uh, uh, consult or uh, or imbibe. Therefore, this uh, livable uh, life in the future, I feel, has to have some kind of a very uh, considered, tiered approach that uh, uh, 
it should start with the basic elementary uh, ground level and then go up to the individuals. Of course, we have to assume responsibility. And I, for one, am very, very conscious of the fact uh, of my responsibilities as far as the quality of life of the ordinary people is concerned or saving their life. But uh, they need to be, uh, they need to also accept and understand where we are coming from. Just because we give a, a sermon is not good enough. We'll have to find a way how to make it effective and how to impact the majority of the population in a country like India, because we are not the only country where this problem would uh, uh, apply. Mm. Yes. Yes, indeed, it is a reminder that um, empathy uh, and many of us, including myself, during lockdown, we have been confronted with ourselves, confronted with a huge transformation and, and, and focusing on, on, on this, this other, this increased level of consciousness of our connectedness across the world. But that, that applies to some uh, people like us that, that are privileged at the same time, not only in India, not only in Africa, not only in Latin America, but probably in many other p places uh, in, the, in the more developed uh, economies, uh, people are really f uh, confronted first with uh, survival, with having the income to be able to take care of the basic needs. And uh, that is an element that really needs to be considered as well. And where there's no time for deep reflection and, and, uh, and thought. At the same time, um, to be reminded of the capacity of adaptation of a human being, the capacity of intelligence of a human being, uh, is not only through intelligent conversations that we're having, it is also um, through many other ways. And some of them we're familiar with and others we're still uh, getting to know better. Anne Gonzalo, what would you like to say about this? Well, I, I first would like to, um, to, to continue on the, on the point that Mr. Mawa brought that I think is fundamental and I totally agree and, and happy that you, Camila, brought Africa as well because uh, we are facing so many challenges very similar to the ones that Mr. Mawa uh, mentioned. Uh, regarding Africa, and that connects again the topic of the basic needs, the basic level of awareness, how much they understand globality, and then uh, how much it is very well related to how those uh, populations and those countries are uh, are capable of confronting whether it's COVID-19 or the climate crisis or any other. I I'm wondering whether there is, and and don't and, and not necessarily having a right answer to that major question that Mr. Mewa brought in, uh, th th that is fundamental, is, is that how, uh, isn't it possible that we can use something that is incredibly powerful and has been tremendously useful, that is the internet. Internet is probably uh, having a great capacity of reaching population either in China, in India, in Africa, we're already using it. And people don't necessarily understand how that is governed, but it's absolutely global. It is indeed. People going to the internet, they are connecting to things that somehow seems to be magical. And, and it is indeed governed by technicians all around the world that connect to certain values and certain concepts. It is working. I'm not saying that I have the formula, but as we see that the world is failing in some ways, we are at the same time uh, striving properly in some others, while, uh, while internet is showing us, for example, that there is a possibility of bringing that sense of globality to even small villages in places like India or Africa, where people have, at the end, they are changing their behaviors in a very natural way, not necessarily understanding everything on the depth that we probably have in this conversation, but they are changing. They have changed 
dramatically and very rapidly in the last decade through tools that are related to this, to this technology. Is there something that might help us to connect something that is very unnatural as the high technology to something as natural as the need of, uh, of, of living in a balanced and sustainable way? So, so I would just I would like to throw that to the conversation so, because I think that probably even in the last village of India, this is a question, Mr. Uh, Mewar, is it internet something that is connecting people, changing their habits, and bringing globality? Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased and delighted uh, that you have uh, uh, seen my point. Internet is the answer because electronically uh, connecting people is the only way the world can be connected and we can come to a global thinking and make people understand this is global and the price is right when it comes to uh, uh, trying to educate people through the medium of uh, the internet. And I, unfortunately, today in India, there are, there are uh, Wi-Fi and internet in uh, electricity uh, in practically all the villages. Uh, which may not be in certain countries in certain other parts of the world, which means that uh, everybody, the, the, the uh, lowest common denominator, so this way you are uh, uh, breaking the uh, rigidity of just the uh, localized kind of uh, thinking to, I say, global kind of a thinking. Now, if we can achieve that, then it's just a matter of what news feed, what uh, knowledge we download and transmit to these people. Because I know the Indians have a very high IQ, they are hardworking, but what we are actually uh, lacking is uh, the direction. And if proper direction is provided, proper knowledge is uh, transferred, I see no reason except in a, in a few uh, years' time, which is not a great uh, amount of time uh, to make such a major impact in such uh, an environment, we will succeed. And give me another minute. I want to make another point while I've, I've still got the mic. Uh, all these people that I'm talking about may be unskilled workmen, workforce, but they are very, very important for the industry because without them, the industry cannot function. And they must be made aware of their contribution towards the, uh, the, the growth uh, uh, and uh, therefore economic advancement. Don't talk to them about GDP. Don't talk to them about all that. Because it, it, at this stage, it will not mean anything. But in very simple language, in our local language, we tell them that you are very important for the growth of India. And that can only be done if proper programming can be shot down through the internet and some NGO uh, or, or a public-private uh, association can put up these centers, and especially in the rural areas, and say, hey, uh, just listen to this. And in very simple language, uh, in, of course, the local language, and we have so many languages that the language in which you will have to communicate down uh, in, uh, south in, uh, say, Tamil Nadu to up north in, uh, in the Punjab, uh, that colloquial language has to be put. I, I agree with you, senor, that uh, this is the way forward, but we need to make programs. The internet is available and it is very rapidly being uh, spread in India and people's dependence on internet is also increasing. So uh, it's not that... Uh, uh, they are not, uh, uh, you know, 
chronically savvy. They are. And they will soon become savvy in a, in a, in a year's time. So if you are talking about livable, uh, sustainable uh, life after COVID, that is the way to go, in my opinion. Thank you. I would like to hear what Anne would, would like to say about this, uh, because then there's a balance about the role of the body, the individual, the, the balance of how technology affects your life and the way you understand your role in society and in nature. So Anne, if you can react to that, please. Well, my response to that is yes, and, and absolutely yes. Um, there's so much to do and so many ways that we can connect to each other. Um, your earlier question, uh, Gonzalo, about love um, is the one that comes to mind in response. And that is the, the industrial structure that we have. Uh, doesn't do much for love. Um, it does a lot for exploitation and extraction. Um, and the structure, so there, the, we behave in response to our interior workings, our emotional workings, but also absolutely in response to the structures um, that surround us and frame our lives, let's say. Um, and so the industrial structures, the economic structures, are they the best we can do for ourselves? would be a question I would have at one level. And do they, do they help us to become the best that we can be? Um, do they help us to find a sustainable balance amongst ourselves and with the planet? Um, and I think the other, the other response that comes as I envision a world interconnected on the, the net at all levels is, you know, how do, how do we, how do we do that, but do it with balance? We seem to do everything that we do like full out. So this is the answer and we're going to go down that road and we're just going to do it until we drive ourselves to death. You know, and it's, it, what is the saying about um, poison? What is poison? Um, you know, it's too much of something. Um, and I think finding that dynamic balance, I think, you know, we have a sort of historic tendency, maybe. I, you know, I don't know what that means in a global sense of historic tendency, as we have so many histories. But there's a tendency in a human creature, I think, you know, to want to have a single solution and just say, okay, if I just do this, everything's going to be fine. Um, and that's just not how it is. You know, it's complicated and we have to stay awake and we have to stay uh responsive to, and this is at all levels, so whether we're involved in creating the structures that frame behavior, or whether we're in the, you know, in the midst of behaving, um, you know, yeah. Anyway, so maybe, maybe something along those lines, but I think remembering about connection and community at all levels, not just the global, but the smaller, and that they're like, it's, I think we're looking for maybe fractal expressions of something good and something that has a dynamic balance that's sustainable. You mentioned fractal uh, structures and, and to put it very easy in, in layman's words, uh, a, a, a fractal, fractals is really about uh, one about elements sort of being created out of a bigger element and creating new elements. And when I think fractal, I also think uh, non-centrality, but, but that every fractal is independent in the way it executes reality and in the way it, it behaves and it, in the way it does. Uh, so I'm, tr I'm trying to, to come forward with a, with a simple layman's word of, of what the concept of fractals is. Uh, it's not top down. It's not top down, and it's uh, each has an expression that is authentic to themselves. Is that what what you would think? Um, I think when I think of fractal expression, like through the body, like say for example, a pattern of behavior I have with my body um, is you know ignoring a certain amount, a certain place of pain. Then that expression, that habit, that pattern. I replicate it again in relation to 
something I'm uncomfortable with in my world in relation to other people where I shut it down. I don't want to hear it. And that's a blind spot. And then, you know, I take that pattern and repeat it and repeat it at different scales. So a similar pattern repeated at different scales, just, you know, in using that pattern as a, mm, well, maybe I'll leave it there. <laughs> yes. Perhaps it can be a reference without it being a copy, without imposing itself that much. Maybe. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all new language to me, and yet there's something beautiful about looking at, you know, on different scales from the small to the large, um, what is repeated. Mm. What is, what is reused, what, is, what expresses itself again and again, I suppose. Yes. Mr. Mevara Gonzalo, what, what do you think? Is this uh, evoking any thoughts with you? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, one will have to bring the government into this. And our government is already conscious of the fact that this is what is required. And it's one of their objectives as well that this uh, level of population should be made aware as quickly as possible. They should uh, understand their responsibility and discharge it in a, in a manner in which it is in the interest of the nation. Now, uh, a dissent, for instance, is not always bad in a democracy because unless you express your views, it uh, is very difficult for people to understand, the people who are governing to understand that what do the masses want? You've got to be connected with the masses in case, in, uh, uh, in the event that you want an effective impact of the policies that you are enacting in Parliament. Uh, make that simple. And I'm sure uh, the government will also uh, support any such efforts. And I'd like to say, uh, that uh, here in India, we've also got people at this level who can think like uh, and understand completely what we are talking about at the level at which we are talking about today. So it's a question of roping them in and roping other people from other parts of the world and coming up with a joint program which makes sense uh, all over. It's kind of... Uh, a uniform kind of a program, basically, which uh, would make sense. And it's not that there's a certain program which is for India and another one for Africa and another one for the United States. No. Some really uh, a thinking, uh, a brain who, who, who knows this better than what any of us do should be involved in creating a platform with the maximum and optimize the impact. Uh, <clears throat> well, with the with the little risk of becoming a little bit controversial, I I think that I I do agree that probably like the 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 um, governments and the politicians are, are all the time looking at what the mass and the population wants, but I think that this pandemic has shown us that it might, sometimes it's more important to understand what do we really need more than what we want. And, uh, and, and in that sense, I tend to think that uh, what is being questioned, and it seems to me proper to start questioning it, is like, what are those basic real needs that we have to set up for the whole population? What is well-being for everybody? And how, it, how that is really related to consumption, where consumption has become an act of looking for uh, happiness, in the act of just buying and owning and not necessarily properly connected to the well-being? Is it that uh, somehow we should start thinking more wisely and more seriously about a general basic income and really reaching for the real needs in search of the well-being of the global population and fighting greed and fighting the need of some people to really <clears throat> uh, own sometimes too much in the sake um, um, 
like, like against sometimes the general global uh, well-being. Uh, so those are elements that at the end are think I think that are now being as present uh, more present than ever uh, with the pandemic, where we see also uh, many governments around the world being capable of uh, mobilizing uh, supplies and 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 money uh, to support the general needs of the population. Is it something that might be changing and therefore generating? a level of consciousness of reaching that well-being through basic needs and then build up from there while that requires a, a, probably an act of generosity from so many of us worldwide? Yeah, so greed is an interesting topic um, because it drives a lot of what's been going on. Um, and, and, you know, I think that this is just a, something to me is really important is that we address what drives us. Um, and I think in my country, which is the US, this is where I was raised, um, we had structurally imposed uh, in the 50s, I believe, um, a system that perpetuated greed and created consumption. And this was a manipulation of the ideas of Sigmund Freud. So using public relations to basically control the masses. And it was based on the idea that the masses, so it was based on Freud's idea that what's inside each of us is this, you know, just this uh, bestial creature that, that needs to be controlled. And you know, I, I think maybe underlying a lot of the structural creations that we make for ourselves um, is a question of well, what do we believe that we are as human beings? Um, do we believe that we're good? Do we believe that we're evil? Do we believe that we're capable of loving behavior? Do we believe that we're capable of generosity? Um, I think it's John Maynard Keynes, who uh, was an economist, believed that all of the structures, the institutions, the belief systems, that everything that we generate uh, in our world were driven by the need to give ourselves courage in face of the unknown. Um, and I was kind of surprised when I, when I learned that the human mind cannot tolerate uncertainty um, and actually responds to uncertainty with fear. Um, or with our fear reflex, which means we either go into fight, flight, or freeze, which means that we can't think, we just act in response. And I think that there's that little space, uh, I think it was Viktor Frankl who said that beautiful statement of between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space, we can make a choice, and that's the prefrontal cortex. But I think that when our systems are constructed to profit from greed, when they are stimulating fear in order to be generated um, so that when they thrive on having everyone afraid of each other in competition with each other, when, when we have that going, it happens at every level. So at the individual level, at the communal level, at the national level, um, we're afraid of everything because we've been raised to be afraid of each other, of ourselves and everything around us. And I think fear has its place. I'm not saying that it doesn't, um, I'm not stupid, but at the same time, we needn't be afraid all the time of everything. You know, if a lion is coming, then yes, that fight, flight, or fear reflex is a good thing. Use it, get out of the way. Um, you know, but if it's simply stress about, you know, any of the ridiculous things that, you know, make us consume things that we don't need, um, it's not, it's not serving, it's not serving our best growth. Uh, and with the utmost respect uh, to your uh, observation, I would like to or beg to uh, differ with the, the word control. I, I have removed this word from my vocabulary because I feel that uh, this is not what we want. Uh, everything else apart, control is in the hands of 
all powerful people uh, or person or despot or whatever is a very dangerous thing. If anything, in a democracy, you've got to allow people to think for themselves. If they are not able to think at the level at which you are comfortable or which you desire, fine, we develop it. But we do not control their wishes, their mind. Go on. I'm not sure um, what I said that you're referring to specifically. Would you clarify that for me? Uh, as I understood it, uh, well, as I understood it, it was uh, you said about uh, uh, controlling uh, the whole program. This is what I'm objecting to. Yeah, and I would object to that too, hundred <laughs> percent. What I was saying was that um, an old uh, econ econ economist had said that the structures that we create and the belief systems and institutions that we create have been previously driven by our need or wish to control. I'm not saying at all that that's what they should do or that I think we can do far better than that at this point. Then we are in agreement. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And at the same time, it's so important to understand the, the, the dominating thoughts of our present and of our past, uh, such as the elements that Anne was evoking on, on public relations and, uh, and, and the way uh, the corporation is defined by law in the United States that imposes uh, profit-making above the well-being of the people that are uh, part of that company and, and uh, so many other aspects that, uh, that are still dominating um, our, not only our minds and the way our organizations are made, but also our vocabulary. Yes. Perhaps I would like to, uh, to, uh, to move on in the conversation. I would like to ask, uh, ask you all to think of the future. So having understood and, and shared a little bit of what, where we are and, and uh, what is happening today, what our challenges are, um, the future, what is the future for you and how do you envisage it or what would be the elements that are most needed? Uh, when I think of future, I think of something that today is not existing yet. So our experience is based on today and on yesterday. The future is something that nobody knows. Uh, so what, what is it that you would like to share from, from, the, from the point of view of your work? and from the point of view of your, your imagination. Please, Gonzalo. Okay, happy to jump in. Thank you, thank you, Camila. Um, of course, let me first recognize that I wake up every day being very realistic. So I know where we're standing and how challenging are these days and, and, and with everything changing, even on a weekly or sometimes on a daily basis. I then decide to become an optimist, right? Every morning I wake up realistic, but then I become an optimist. And, and, and through that, uh, I've been working with this uh, role that, 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 I, that I'm so grateful of having, uh, being the high level champion means mobilizing the, the non-state actors for, for climate action. Uh, that was one year ago when I received the mandate. And I noticed that the first thing that was important is to put everybody together into one single goal. And that goal was very simple for me to understand because we have just received the information from the scientists of the world that we require a carbon neutral world by 2050, the latest, in order to be capable of reaching with a certain probability the, the increase of the temperature no more than 1.5 degrees at the end of the century. So in that sense, I said, OK, we need everybody that is willing to work for a, new, a carbon neutral world by 2050 all together. And, and when, when you bring that to the parties, to the nations, it becomes a little harder because some of them have their own uh, challenges, internal challenges or political challenges. It was not, was not very easy to put everybody together as it was in Paris Agreement 
back in 2015. So I decided to put together, I mean, me with, with a lot of people, right? Uh, the, the, the role of the high level champion is to mobilize many, many people and, and work with the coalitions. And, and, and there were so many fantastic coalitions worldwide that were willing to, 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 to bring uh, their efforts together. So we launched what is called the Climate Ambition Alliance. It's a coalition of coalitions, not doing something new in terms of asking those that have been working to uh, start from scratch, but just to put every effort together. And, uh, and a, a few uh, days uh, ago, we, we, we launched, uh, well, we announced the new number of nations, uh, regions, like, for example, California or New York, right? Those states that are, have a capability of mobilizing, regardless of the role of the national government. Then uh, we, uh, we brought together businesses, investors, now we brought universities, uh, all of them together are now representing 53% of the global GDP, 2.6 billion people in terms of population. That is massive. So a few days ago, we reached a point, even in the midst of the pandemic, where we have a capability of bringing all of those that are really are capable of committing, some of them with their personal effort, some of them with their small organization business, some of them with their money, with their investment, and most of them with the capacity of voting for the real and, and the relevant uh, leaders that are, will mobilize us from now, hopefully to Glasgow next year at COP26, with a major commitment of uh, nations and non-state actors, all of us committed to, to, to create that net zero and resilient world, hopefully a lot earlier than 2050. So that is possible. I'm now on the, like, bring the sense of hope, but mostly and speaking with people from India and from the United States, we need much more from those countries as well. And, and there's a capacity of bringing, again, non-state actors. It's not necessarily that we expect the national government to commit, we can mobilize people, uh, educational organizations or business leaders. And uh, of course, local governments that in many regions are much more important than the national one. Yes, Gonzalo. And this is, uh, this is an, uh, I would like to, to ask a question of clarification to Mr. Munoz. Um, so, an increasing number of people are aware of what is happening uh, at the different COPs every year, uh, but still many don't. Uh, the work that you're saying, can, can you perhaps explain in, 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 in layman's words, could you explain this for, uh, for any of the people watching this video today, um, what you foresee in the future um, for a, a a normal person, um, an accountant in 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 Africa, or uh, a cleaning person, or a nurse in any part of the world, and what do you think uh, could be their role? Because a lot of people are knowing that things are happening, are seeing that, and are feeling um, the impact, but but we don't know where to start, what to do. Sure. Thank you, Camila. Well, we are facing extremely challenging times within the, our relationship as one particular species, a human being, with our unique environment. There's no way that we will solve this by going into Mars or some other planet. I mean, we have to solve how do we relate, how do we live, not only within us, but also with the other species that live with us in this amazing planet called Earth. And, and, and of course, there's a matter of we are so many, uh, right? Uh, the, the, the human population, this is the, what we are living in terms of challenge is due to our success as species. And we have to rebuild the way to live in this unique planet. And that requires solving some very urgent aspects, not only like the pandemic, but the climate crisis that is affecting the most vulnerable, the, the most and the worst. So those that have less, say, responsibility on generating the crisis are the ones that are being mostly affected. I mean, the vulnerable population, those people in rural areas that require a, a healthy environment, a healthy weather and water for their crops, 
sometimes for basic survivance. Uh, and, and those small islands in which are being affected by the raise of the of the water uh, of the sea level. So so this is a matter of urgency because the weather behaves uh, very, let's say, slowly, but with an inertia that is extremely, extremely hard to change. So we have a window of opportunity of a decade in which we have to do massive changes. Those massive changes are, of course, related to how do we understand energy, fuel. We have burned fuel that is in the depth to mobilize carbon into the atmosphere, and that's changing the climate. The way we produce our food is fundamental. We have uh, destroyed, in many cases, the nature that we need, and, and we have destroyed the richness of the soil and the, the, our, our own need of biodiversity while producing the food that we require to feed so many people in the world. And we have missed an opportunity that we have to recover on putting finance, the role of money, into the right direction, aligning the right incentives for that element to be an element that creates uh, well-being and not only richness and profit for a few. So yeah. that's a massive opportunity. How can we change that? First, we, we all have the power of voting. Second, we all have more or less a power of purchase. Third, we can use our talent, not only by designing where do we uh, work, but also in those places where we, where we uh, work, we can raise our voice by saying this is important. And fourth, we have the power of love. We can bring this conversation within our beloved and, and therefore generate a massive conversation. That's the learning that the children of the world are bringing us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Mavar. Well, uh, I think that's, that's a good place to start. I, I'll be very brief here. Uh, I'd be very keen to know the agency in India with which, with whom you are interacting, senor, because our foundation has also got the same objectives which is improve the quality of life of the common man and uh, make all possible efforts to make sure that uh, uh, they have a, a longer, uh, more comfortable uh, life. Now, uh, if uh, this program is already underway in India and if you are in uh, touch with them, if you don't mind, I could through Camilla. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I uh, would like you to know that I'm representing a foundation, uh, a charitable foundation, and we have the same, of course, worded differently, objectives uh, as what the senor just now uh, pointed out. And... Uh, we certainly want to uh, uh, improve the quality of life of the common man and give them uh, all the coverage we possibly can as far as medicine is concerned, as far as uh, uh, environment uh, or how to preserve the environment and so on and so forth is concerned. Now this uh, pandemic has, uh, without anybody telling anybody anything, have proved that now post uh, COVID-19, where everybody was locked down and in isolation and in quarantine, we found that uh, uh, a place like Delhi, which was the most polluted, uh, has come up in numbers in, in an unbelievable fashion. The, the, the rivers uh, have become clean. Nobody has done anything except the fact that we've stopped polluting it. Uh, the lakes have uh, become much cleaner uh, and more portable drinking water, not because we've set up a, 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 a plant or a recycling thing, but it's just the fact that human beings have stopped polluting it. So it has been proved beyond doubt that it's man who is creating all this difficulty as far as the environment is concerned. Therefore, I, I entirely agree that this is what we need to tell. And 
taking my uh, the point earlier, the uh, last point, we need to use technology to work for us. It's time we get the technology to work for us, or else uh, we won't be able to make the kind of impact. And I, I endorse the fact that there is an urgency, and there's an urgency that a lot of these things should have been done yesterday, not tomorrow. So, uh, in brief, this is what I have to say, and I think with the uh, passion to do that, somebody needs to come and direct us or give us the tools uh, with which we can become effective. And when I say we, I'm talking about the foundation where we are in a position uh, to comprehend what uh, we are talking about at the level at which we are talking about. And then it will be our uh, responsibility to dissipate it to the lowest common denominator, which we'll be very happy to do. Because it's it's not something where we are trying to uh, earn revenue. So I think uh, as, as a very, very significant uh, and interesting point, and I'd like to uh, go on record as having said that we will support if such a collaborative uh, proposal is put to the foundation. Yes, wonderful. Wonderful. So, um about the future, what would you like to say and about envisioning the future? So today in this conversation, specifically in response to this conversation, um, I would say <laughs> that I, I would envision redefining success. And I would definitely encourage not only everyone at all levels to think for themselves, but also to take responsibility, to, to feel a sense of the ability to respond to what they encounter in ways that make sense to them and to, to not be arrested for that, but rather, um, <laughs> uh, and what I mean is, there's a fine line between a rebel and an artist um, and I'd like to see all of us uh, engage artistically, which means that, you know, you don't break the whole thing. You don't, you don't disrespect what's there, but you engage creatively and inventively. And that does destabilize and challenge that which is pre-existing. Um, at the same time, it's a constructive growth process. So I would ask or envision or wish for that as well as letting love be that driving force that, and, and to give space for love to emerge. Um, structures we have don't actually let love emerge. We have to actually find it in little uh, private pockets. Um, but I would love to see structures that allow for us to care for each other and not have to be punished for doing that. So, yeah. And I think that's a largely economic, uh, largely an economic thing. Yeah, largely economic, because despite difference in cultures and many other differences around the world, the economic one is, is very often really the dominating one uh, increasingly. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I'd like to start closing off. Um, and before I close off, and I will give a very short a recap of, uh, of today in the words that I'd like to bring forward. I would like to also invite each of you to think of one thing uh, that, um, that you have, that has struck you or that you have learned uh, today from, from another speaker. So what are the insights that you have uh, acquired today in this conversation from, from another speaker? I think my takeaway from this conversation is a real appreciation of the vastness of the world, which is beautiful, um, from the masses in India to the to the just the the extraordinary coming together through projects that make a difference, that have an impact, so that that yeah, just bringing it all together and. And I think just a really beautiful, and I'm grateful for the reminder 
um, and the affirmation from a different community than my own of the importance and the need and the place for love um, in my own world that's often taken for granted so much so that after a while you think it, you know, it really can't matter. So I really appreciate hearing that from a different perspective that that does have value. Thank you, Anne. Gonzalo. Well, uh, um, I'm taking um, the, the, the importance of understanding our own limitations uh, and, how, and therefore how important it is for us to be available for learning uh, of what is happening to others, what is happening uh, in other places of the world. So the, the, the same, the, even the limitation of I'm all the time living in a limited space that's not necessarily aware of what is happening in, in the other part of the world is fundamental for bringing in not only this learning and, and knowing, but also for opening new possibilities. And, 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 and those possibilities <clears throat> connected to the uh, opportunity of each of us becoming a better person while connecting to others, while understanding what is happening to others, while empathizing with others, and therefore uh, mobilizing, just like trying to become better and act. Thank you. Thank you so much for these, uh, these heartfelt words of, uh, of, of sharing and of, of connection. Uh, so hereby we, we close up this uh, wonderful experience. Uh, thank you. Uh, we spoke about so many different things, about embodiment, we spoke about our economic system, we spoke about the government, we spoke about fear and control. And uh, what I feel at this moment is really a, a, a fresh energy uh, of um, willingness to, to, to act and, and really sort of having, having this, this sense of uh, really being able to, um, to, to face today and tomorrow and really little step by little step making sure i have a better understanding a better connection and uh, a, a better uh, feeling to 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 go forward and and make this a better place make this world a better world thank you everybody and have a wonderful day thank you thank you bye bye <laughs>